Well, this week you had two articles to look at. One uh, about Benedetta Cotulli on double entry bookkeeping, and one about how Marina de Raffaelli approached the same topic. The two of them uh, are joined to the hip because, as you know, Cotulli's book. The Art of Trade is bound together with Raffaelli's manual on double entry bookkeeping. But you know the background to that. You know that this was not discovered until 1989. The accounting historians didn't realize it until 1999. And it was completely ignored from then until. Um, 2013. Now the book that's bound, they're bound together in one book, and that book is in the National Library of Malta. It's uh, an imposing looking building in its own right. Um, has a statue of Queen Victoria outside it. And it's not exactly where tourists go. So even though the book was hidden in plain sight. It's not, it just had passed everyone by. The part of the uh, National Library where we work, if you go there, is shown now. And as you can see, it's just like a, it's like a library. One big difference is that it, because it's an archive, archival source, you have to actually go and request every single book you want to see to. And you can't just go and take uh, a book off the shelves. Well, this is the book. That's what it looks like. It's a real book. Um, and you can see I put a ruler along it to get the length of it, to measure the length of it when I was there. And this is what it actually measures 21 centimeters by 15 by 2. That's about. Um, well, you can you can work it out. Twenty one by fifteen by two. It's not big. It's not a big book, but it's very tightly bound, so it makes it quite difficult to actually get past the writing. When you look at old texts like this, the people that work in that field like to look closer at the paper, and I'll show you that in a minute. When you open the book, this is what you see. The um, writing here is not a dedication from Benedetto Truly to Francesco di Stefano. This um, is, was written onto the front of the book at this point, uh, at the point that it got to Malta. Now as to where, how the, where the parts of the book came from, two locations. There's Naples, where Cotrulli was, where he was near when he wrote it, his, uh, his book, The Art of Trade, and Venice, where De Raffaele dictated his book to his student. We know that, apart from the type of bookkeeping, which would suggest Venice, and Cotrulli's involvement, which would suggest Naples. We have confirmation from the watermarks. And you look at those when you're looking at old uh, items like this, and people will look at them even sometimes for when looking at um, account books, because the watermark tells you the date of the paper. And I think, as I mentioned before, it's quite possible that someone has made a false version of something, just made it up. So it's always good to check the evidence, so you can check documentary evidence using the watermarks. And that's a watermark, as you can see, 4070 to 4073, the paper was manufactured, it was written on in 1475, that's consistent. 
And that's page page one, looks like, in Cotrilli's book. Very ornate, thinking back to what has been said, was said last week about gifts. They, um, the way that that is prepared indicates that some respect was being uh, given by a Raffaelli when he was copying Cotrilli's book because he was going to give it as a gift or at least not so much as a gift he was going to give it to his pupil as part of his education so it's got gold leaf and it's red painting it's just one or two examples of that in the book so it makes it look a very impressive book when you go through Cotrilli's book um, you get to the point where you see the information relating to well the five pages relating to double entry and related aspects of running a business. Now in those five pages I give us a basic outline of what the double entry is as you read for this week at the beginning of this week and that overview is what you would have got typically if you were going into work in a business at that period of time in um, Venice just introducing you to how the bookkeeping was done just generally with a little bit of specific information like where's the debit was a credit and so on However, right at the end, or the, near the very end of that five pages, Cotrulli moves sideways into business records as a whole. And he talks about what you should do about things that won't necessarily always end up going into the journal. And there's actually quite a lot of those sort of documents that go around in a business. If you've got uh, arrangements to relating to a contract, you should write them down somewhere. And he suggests in your memorandum, which is your day book, that, so that you will remember them, basically, is the idea. And he goes on to say, you should keep your office well organised and all that you receive note to these things. Put them all in one place and make sure you write on them that you've replied to them. And then every month, tidy them up and then put them somewhere safe. And also preserve all paid bills of exchange. It paid ones because you need evidence that you paid them. Bind them up in string, preserve them as a necessity. Important documents, preserve as a necessity. Important documents such as notarized deeds, which are contracts which have been formally recorded by a notary which we would maybe refer to now as a lawyer or solicitor, and unnotarized agreements. And he makes a point because they were not uncommon. So this, this section, a small section, spread across two pages with text in between some of it, is truly emphasizing the importance for, to be a, for a good merchant to not only record everything in his account books, relating to his transactions but to make sure all the evidence that he needs to support his business and to validate the entries in the account books are kept in a safe place. And he concludes in the same section, if you do your bookkeeping well you can call yourself a merchant. If you do not you won't be worthy of the name merchant and you should always pay attention to your bookkeeping because it affirms that it confirms your word because the account books provide the evidence to support the claims of the merchant. Now that's what came through from uh, Lattice's analysis of the medieval statutes, where the account books were evidence of the word of a merchant, and that they could be produced in court in the right circumstances to verify it. And when that happened, you needed the evidence to back it up, which is why. He makes the point, you must organise and keep every bit of evidence you've got. 
and make sure you note down anything that might be relevant to your business, even if it's not going into your account books. Now you've read what Catrilli said about double entry, so let's move on to De Raffaele. We know that it was written in Venice because of the watermark. Now you note the dates of the watermark. It's over 50 years before the uh, manual was written. So these were scrap pieces of paper that were take, brought together for the, the pupil to write, the student to write his notes. And in fact, some of the paper in there is not watermarked or doesn't appear to be watermarked, might not be from the same batch of paper because the pages are very mixed up in terms of where the watermark appears compared to where we would expect it in a modern book. But Clearly this paper was just lying about, picked up and used and cut to size, the same size as the paper used in the, uh, the copy of Quattrulli's book. Now these are the first two pages. I'm going to give you some indication of the sorts of things that people do in archives or with archival material when, it's, um, when they get it. And this of course depends on how expert they are at particular things. And the reason I'm going to show you this is just to emphasize the importance of interdisciplinary help or knowledge from other disciplines. Those are the first two pages I said and if you look carefully at this image you can see this the shape of the book. Uh, you can see the edging of the, the pages has been inked. And it really does, I assure you, it really does look like that. And then um, if you look at the page on the left, those are the instructions, basic instructions in double entry. Now that page I've reproduced here is in three main sections. It starts apart from the title at the top. It then has a section on the journal, which is what all the entries in this manual are for. It doesn't leave you high and dry. It tells you what to do with the entries from the journal once you've made them, how they get from there into the ledger. And then finally, there's a section on the inventory, or the aventoria, of the merchant who is going to be the subject of this, if you like, case study that's built up of a business. Now, if you take the, the first section there, the name and the journal, This is um, how I first got this, sent to me from the National Library in Malta. That was on the 8th of March 2015. Now if you look at the bottom of the screen here, the first line I separated out. So what I did was I took an image of that first line and I pasted it into a word table. And I did that for all the lines that you can see there. On the left, you have the point that I'd got to in five days in transcribing that text. And if you look carefully and compare it to what's on the right, you'll see that it's not particularly correct and it's got gaps in it. It is incredibly difficult for someone who has not studied that handwriting, type of handwriting, to do that. At that point, I received a, an email from a specialist in reading that type of handwriting. And on the right is what his email told me that text said. And that's why we do these things with an interdisciplinary perspective. History done by one discipline using only the tools of that discipline is very, very difficult. And there's an example of one of the accounts, or sorry, one of the journal entries from the manual. If you look at the translation below, and you look carefully at it, you can see that it's going from ducats to lira. So the money of account is very obvious. 
193 ducats divided by 10 is 19.3. And that's basically what you see all the way through. The pair is debit. And if you read that honey from the mark, A, the A is credit. And they're almost all structured the same way. So it's very formulaic and very easy to follow. And that's where you put in the journal. And then you go to the ledger, which is obviously not covered in this manual, and they make the entries in those two accounts. Now, just as to where the, this manual fits within education of, of accountants, and that's a branch of accounting history that um, there's a reasonable amount of literature on. It's very obviously very near the beginning. Um, what we have, first of all, and what everyone thought was where accounting was taught, until quite recently, was the Abaco manual. Now Abaco is uh, business maths, applied maths for business, effectively. And it was taught from the beginning of the 12th century approximately to the end of the, of the 16th, roughly, in northern Italy. And it was always assumed until people started looking into education that Bookkeeping was taught in those schools because they contain examples contain the words for debit, the words for credit, and they referred to things like accounts from time to time. But the reality, they weren't teaching double entry, they were teaching things you do with a double entry record, or they were just using the terminology in its natural sense. And once people began to realize that, they perspective of where people learned bookkeeping, double entry bookkeeping, changed. And while the majority still think, account historians still think it was taught in business schools, the back of schools, it wasn't. It was it was taught in the workplace, which is a point made earlier in the course. The next one and the first one to teach anything to do with double entry was Cotrulli with his five pages. Sort of the introduction. What do you get day one in the in the new job? Next was the Raffaelli's from 1475, which was a commissioned um, tutoring of probably the son of a wealthy family, so that that person could go into the business. And the whole point was of these lessons that are contained in Raffaelli was to train that person to be good at bookkeeping before he started. And then once in the job, he would build on that. And the thinking behind that was that it would probably save him two years, because that was roughly the minimum time it would take to learn how to do bookkeeping in the workplace. So it would save him that. And over those first couple of years, he'd become very proficient, whereas it would have taken him four years to do that had he just gone straight into the business. Then you got Pacioli, and we're going to come to him next week. The thing about Pacioli was that he changed the whole game. If you look at uh, Catrulli de Raffaelli and the Abaco Manual, the or handwritten manuscripts, Pacioli was the first to print, and his printing propelled the method double entry bookkeeping across Europe. There were between one and two thousand copies printed of that book. I will come, come as I say, I'll come to that later. And his book, book was followed next by one by Talienti in 1525, which he didn't write, but he helped to publish. And the person that actually wrote it would have been a tutor of double entry in a school that taught, obviously, double entry. And that school might have had only one student because there was a lot of people taught just one student, two students, and some would teach classes. That again was pub printed. We don't know how many copies, but there were two editions. So, and given its size, it would have been quite cheap. 
it was um, smaller by a considerable margin than the textbook for this course. And it, as with Pacioli, it spread the method of double entry, but mainly in Venice. And then the final one I want to mention is just Manzoni, who really took everything Pacioli had done and put it together, along with the method of uh, Di Raffaele. And what that means is shown on this slide. There is no real instruction in double entry in Catrulli, not enough at least, to, to actually learn the method. In Darfaeli's book, there's a generic approach plus the specific case of a silk um, company, which was very specific and clearly was linked to the family business of the student. And the whole thing was an exemplar book of entries from a journal, and there are about 300 of them. Then you go to Pacioli, generic. There was no specific, um, no specific sector of the of business that it was aimed at. It was just anyone who was going to be or already was a wholesale business person. The instruction was at a basic level. And there was a lot of instruction, that was the main part. And only 25 journal entries and 19 lecture entries, but there, at least there was one. Uh, there was, sorry, at least there was some material on both the journal and the ledger, whereas the Raffaele had just been the journal. Then you got Talienti, again generic, nothing special, again for wholesale businessmen, as was the Raffaele as well, as Pacioli. And it was a purely exemplar book. The instructions are between each of the entries and they're not very long. They're just sort of introducing the next example. And there's 137 journal entries, so it's like De Raffaele, no ledger. Then Manzoni, generic, nothing specialized. No, according to the silk uh, merchant, silk manufacturer. Again, it was for wholesale merchants. There was a lot of instruction, just as much as there was in Pacioli's. And there were also exemplar account books, journals, ledgers. So he had 300 journal entries, 600 ledger entries, a much, much bigger book than the others. And that again spread double into bookkeeping, but it did it beyond Venice. It was, it went through seven editions, an estimated seven editions over about 60 years. I was extremely influential in pushing that approach to teaching of accounting out, the combination of the instruction and the exemplary account books. And that approach was carried on for several hundreds of years. So you could take the three ways of doing it. You've got the exemplars, you've got a principles-based approach, which is what Pacioli did, where there's no exemplars and no rules. And then you go to Manzoni, who introduced rules, and the ones that followed him that I didn't mention earlier, they're all setting out rules. And it's the, that's why Manzoni is the one that led to the way that accounting and bookkeeping were taught for hundreds of years. So what does that tell you about the history of, of accounting? Well, it tells you that there was a reasonable demand for instruction, but there wasn't much available in an educational setting. We only know of one tutor in the, in the 15th century. And so the printed book opened the door to spread the method of double entry to anyone who could read it. And that made a big impact on the way bookkeeping was done. And one thing it did was it spread the Venetian method across the rest of Italy. So by the 17th century, in Florence, there are examples of the peered journal and ledger, which didn't exist before in Florence or Tuscany before Pacioli printed his manual. 
So it didn't just diffuse the method across Europe, it diffused the Venetian method across Italy, so that eventually it became the dominant method. And that is how the way that we do bookkeeping and accounting today was formed by what Pacioli wrote and Manzoni then applied into the type of instructional vehicle that it was thought was best, one with examples of entire account books, entire journal, entire ledger. The other thing we can get from this is what was actually important to bookkeepers in the 15th and 16th century in Venice. It's all of these books, Venetian. So here's the curriculum. This is what a bookkeeper needed to be able to record. Now, if you look at this, search for profit and loss and balance sheets, income statements and balance sheets, financial statements. You won't find them. Venetians didn't need them. They didn't have the type of partnerships they had in Tuscany, which is why the Venetian double entry system developed very differently from the Florentine system. So if you read in the accounting history literature and it's you read someone right saying that this does not include any instructions in how to do uh, financial reporting or we haven't found any examples of balance sheets from Venice in the 15th century. It's not a surprise. They weren't interested. And these manuals of bookkeeping tell us that by their content. So the books, the account books from that part of Italy don't have any financial statements. And neither do the instructional manuals. So we can conclude that there was no demand to learn how to do financial statements there. Had a manual been printed in Florence, it would have been very different. It would have had financial statement preparation in it. But they never did that because the Florentines were so advanced in their double entry, it was almost second nature to them.